Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Thank you all for being here today. It is such a pleasure to be here at UTM as we unveil our liberal plan to move Canada forward for everyone. We have spent the past three weeks crisscrossing the country talking about our plan for families, for workers, for students, and for seniors. And we haven't shied away from highlighting some pretty stark policy differences. Because in this election, the stakes could not be higher. Canadians have a choice to make. This October, will we let Conservatives like Doug Ford and Andrew Scheer take us backwards? Or will we keep going and build on the progress we've made? Because let's face it, we've moved the dial a lot in just four short years. When Harper's Conservatives were in power, we had flat wage growth, flat job creation, flat economic growth, and quite frankly, flat ambition. People were falling behind. Families were struggling with the rising cost of living, and Conservative politicians were failing them, offering no plan for the future and no way out. So in 2015, people voted for change. They voted for a team that believed in investing in Canadians and growing the middle class. A team that thought helping people rather than cutting programs and services was the right course for Canadian prosperity. Malgré tous les progrès qu'on a réalisés, on sait qu'il reste encore beaucoup à faire. On sait qu'on peut et on doit faire encore plus pour aider les familles. Mais je n'ai jamais été aussi convaincu qu'investir dans les gens est la bonne chose à faire. Après tout, c'est ce que notre bilan démontre. En quatre ans, on a créé plus d'un million d'emplois, la plupart à temps plein. Les parents ont plus d'argent dans leur poche grâce à l'allocation canadienne pour enfants. On a franchi des étapes importantes pour protéger notre environnement et on a sorti 900 000 Canadiens de la pauvreté, dont 300 000 enfants. On a obtenu des résultats concrets pour les Canadiens, des résultats qui font une vraie différence dans la vie des gens. On ne peut pas se permettre de revenir en arrière Et un vote pour les conservateurs, c'est un vote pour revenir aux années Harper. Un vote pour revenir à une époque où on accordait des baisses d'impôts aux plus riches. Où on ne s'occupait pas de l'environnement. Où on enchaînait les coupures. Les Canadiens savent que c'est ce qui arrive quand les conservateurs prennent le pouvoir. Les étudiants ici en Ontario peuvent bien le constater. When he was campaigning, Doug Ford said that not a single person would lose their job to pay for his massive cuts. Well, tell that to the 10,000 Ontario teachers who are losing their jobs. And now, Andrew Scheer is asking you to double down on Conservatives. That's twice the handouts for big polluters and the wealthy, and twice the cuts for you and your family. While Doug Ford focuses on buck a beer, there are grade 12 students that might not graduate this year because there aren't enough teachers to offer the courses they need. He cut Ontario's Pharmacare program. And he scrapped Ontario's cap-and-trade program, which funded energy efficiency initiatives for homeowners, renters, and businesses. Think about that. Cuts to education, to health care, to environmental protection. We can't afford to double down on the Conservatives, not here in Mississauga, not across Ontario, not anywhere in Canada. So here's the Liberal pitch. We will make your life more affordable. 
and we will make our streets safer, and we will fight climate change. That is at the core of what we stand for as a party and as a movement. And we're staying focused on you, because the Conservatives certainly aren't. If If they're elected, the Conservatives will change the tax system. Under a Conservative government, a person making $400,000 a year would benefit more than a person making $40,000 a year with their tax cuts. And if you use a business to create a tax shelter for millions of dollars, well, Andrew Scheer would let you save as much in taxes as the average Canadian earns in a year. That's not right. Canadians need, and Liberals believe in, tax fairness. So we're going to cut taxes, again, for the middle class and those working hard to join it, saving the average family almost $600 a year with nothing for the 1%. And along the way, we'll lift another 38,000 Canadians out of poverty. So while Andrew Scheer focuses on helping the wealthiest few, we'll stay focused on you. On va réduire les factures de téléphone cellulaire de 25% dans deux ans. On va établir un système national de congés payés garantis pour les familles. Et on va vous aider à acheter votre première maison. Et pour assurer la, assurer la sécurité de tous, on va donner aux municipalités le pouvoir d'interdire les armes de poing si c'est quelque chose qui les intéresse. Et finalement, on va interdire les armes d'assaut de style militaire à travers le pays parce que les armes de guerre n'ont pas leur place dans nos communautés. In the fight against climate change, we've done more to protect our environment than any government in Canada's history, from introducing a world-leading oceans protection plan and putting a price on pollution, to phasing out coal and banning single-use plastics. But still, we have more to do. Young people like you are all driving the global movement for climate action. You're calling on your leaders to step up and actually lead. You're frustrated, and so am I. We have more to do, and we will. A re-elected Liberal government will go even further to protect our environment and fight climate change. Under our leadership, Canada will hit net zero emissions by the year 2050. It's an ambitious target. But I know we can get there, and in the process, we'll become world leaders in clean technology. We have the talent, we have the vision, and most importantly, we have the backing from Canadians who want a government that will wake up every day and drive climate action. <laughs> Doug Ford, Jason Kenney, Andrew Scheer, Ils appartiennent tous à une génération de politiciens conservateurs pour qui l'environnement n'est simplement pas important. Ça les intéresse pas et ils ne comprennent pas ce qui est en jeu. Mais nous, on comprend. Dans quelques années, lorsque mes enfants vont me demander ce que j'ai fait pour lutter contre les changements climatiques, j'ai l'intention de leur fournir une réponse solide. Mes chers amis, cette plateforme libérale C'est le plan des libéraux pour continuer de faire avancer notre pays. Et il y a une série de mesures en particulier dont je veux vous parler aujourd'hui. Il s'agit de la section sur l'éducation. Now, education matters to young people across the country, of course. But it's especially top of mind here in Ontario as Doug Ford slashes education funding and makes it near impossible to pay for tuition. But in a rapidly changing global economy, education has never been more important. Because let's face it, people around the world are anxious about their futures. 
As workplaces reimagine to incorporate automation and AI, workers aren't sure where they fit in. You're nervous, and we hear you. Liberals believe in supporting people throughout their education journey. And during our four years in government, we walked the talk, especially when it comes to post-secondary. We increased student grants by 50%. We made it so that no new grad has to start repaying their loan until they're making at least $25,000. And we've changed the rules so people on EI can go back to school without losing their benefits. And of course, we cut interest rates on student loans. That's what we did over the past four years. But more needs to be done, especially now. You see, Conservative provincial governments are trying to balance the budget on the backs of families and students, all while the cost of tuition keeps going up. When I visited colleges and universities across the country or hosted town halls across Canada, the cost of education and the debt that follows are always top of mind. We've all seen the news and heard the stories. More and more students are dropping out because they no longer have funding. Young people are forced to pick up second or third jobs to pay for textbooks or switch to part-time and extend their program by a few years. Young Canadians heading off to school should be excited about embarking on this new journey, but instead are losing sleep and racking their brains over how to pay for it. That's not okay. So our Liberal team is stepping up once again to help students. Today, I'm happy to announce that a re-elected Liberal government will further increase student grants by 40 percent under the old Harper... <laughs> but let, let me tell you what that means. Under the old Harper Conservative government, the maximum Canada student grant was $2,000 a year. But today's announcement, when combined with previous Liberal increases, will bring the maximum Canada student grant to $4,200 a year. And we're doing even more to relieve the financial pressures facing grants. Under our plan, those who carry student loans will have a two-year grace period following graduation, no payments and no interest. Young people just starting their careers should be focused on networking and interviews, so we're going to give you a bit of breathing room to do just that. But we're also going to let new parents hit the pause button on repayment when they have a baby, because in those important early years of starting a family, new parents should be focused on their kids, not on their loans. And finally, we're changing the rules again, so that after the two-year grace period, ro loan repayment won't start until new grads are making at least $35,000 a year. Dans un monde qui évolue constamment et rapidement, ça n'a jamais été aussi important pour les jeunes de faire des études postsecondaires. Nous devons donc rendre l'éducation plus abordable. Alors que les politiciens conservateurs vont faire des coupures, vous pouvez compter sur notre équipe libérale pour investir là où ça compte. Parce qu'au bout du compte, la politique consiste à servir les gens, à vous servir. Et peu importe votre situation, Vous méritez un vrai plan pour l'avenir. In this election, Canadians are faced with an important choice. Will we move backward or will we stand together and choose forward? Here is our promise as Liberals. We won't give tax breaks to the 1% or big polluters, but we will make life more affordable and fight climate change. I'm for moving forward for our planet 
for our students, for families, and for everyone. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. That's right. Merci, mes amis. Thank you. Uh, so the way this is going to work now is I'm going to take uh, some questions from media, and then we're going to open it up, and we're going to do uh, a town hall conversation where you can all ask me questions. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but first of all, we uh, uh, head to uh, the media mic. Mr. Trudeau, thank you. Good, good afternoon. Um, I want to start, my name is Omar from CTV News. I want to start with, um, with the costing of your platform today. You borrowed when times were bad to generate an economic stimulus. Now you're saying times are better, but they could get bad, so you want to continue borrowing. And I'm just wondering, at what point will you start actually paying back the billions you've borrowed? We are making a different choice than the Conservatives do. We're choosing to invest in middle-class Canadians, invest in people's communities, because quite frankly, that is what has worked over the past four years. Responsible investments have led to the creation of over a million new jobs, most of them full-time, and uh, lifting 900,000 people, including 300,000 kids, out of poverty. Conservatives are still making the argument that the way to grow the economy is through cuts and austerity and tax breaks that go to the wealthiest. We disagree. Our plan is focused on investing in Canadians in a fiscally responsible way that means the size of our debt in relation to the size of our economy is low and will keep getting lower every single year. That's the responsible choice that Liberals are making to build a better future for all of you. And I appreciate the support, but let's not applaud the uh, questions and the answers to, uh, to media. We can get around to that afterwards. So we, uh, Trudeau, we'll stay focused on the, the hard respect, questions. With you know, I, I don't think it gets to the heart of what I'm asking. I'm just wondering specifically in terms of thresholds or targets or, or goalposts, at what point do you as leader decide to say, you know what, maybe it's time to, to scale back on the spending and the promises and start paying back? What is your personal threshold to, to come to that realization? We have demonstrated that our approach over the past four years of deciding to invest in the middle class, in their communities, in people right across the country, in science and research, is delivering the kind of opportunity and growth that Canadians need. And we are doing it in a responsible way. I will let the Conservatives explain why cuts and austerity, if they really think so, is going to help Canadians, because we know it won't. It didn't during the Harper years, and that's what we inherited in terms of turning around. But I understand people's focus on the need to stay fiscally responsible, which is why not only will our debt continue to decrease as a proportion of our economy every single year under our plan, but we will retain the AAA credit rating that the international credit rating agencies universally have given to only two G7 countries, Germany and Canada, because our plan is fiscally responsible and will continue to be so. That is how we've created and generated the growth that we've had over the past few years, and it is a clear contrast, I agree, a clear contrast with the Conservatives obsession on cuts in order to balance the books when we already have the best balance sheet in the G7 that this government has put and will continue to put in the service of the Canadian families that need it, not the wealthiest 1%. Okay. Uh, nous avons fait un choix différent des conservateurs qui prônent toujours l'austérité, les coupures dans les services et les avantages au mieux nantis. Nous avons choisi à la place d'investir dans les Canadiens, dans la classe moyenne, dans leur communauté. Et ça a fonctionné pendant quatre ans. On a sorti 900 000 personnes de la pauvreté tout en voyant les Canadiens créer plus d'un million de nouveaux emplois, la plupart temps plein. Mais on reconnaît qu'avec tout l'aide qu'on a fait, il y a encore des gens qui ont besoin de plus d'aide. C'est pour ça qu'on va continuer d'investir dans nos communautés. Les conservateurs, propose des coupures, propose de donner des bénéfices et des avantages aux mieux nantis, 
nous allons continuer d'investir parce que ça a fonctionné. Mais nous comprenons à quel point c'est important de demeurer responsable dans nos investissements. C'est pour ça qu'à chaque année, la taille de notre dette, en proportion à la taille de l'économie, va continuer de diminuer parce qu'on sait que ces investissements de façon responsable, c'est la meilleure façon de continuer à créer la croissance économique qui aide à tout le monde. Good afternoon, Katie Simpson, CBC News. Is there any, from your perspective, is there any sort of timeline, any sort of target date that you have that a liberal government that you will commit to that a liberal government would balance the budget? The Conservatives are the ones obsessed with balancing the budget on the, pa on the backs of services uh, offered to Canadians, on the backs of education, on the backs of our health care system. We are making, we made in 2015, and we're making this year, for the next four years, a very different choice. We are choosing to invest in people and in their communities, and at the same time, stay responsible so that our debt to GDP ratio continues to decrease every single year. There are only two countries in the G7 with unanimous AAA ratings from the international bond rating agencies, Canada and Germany. Our plan is responsible because it invests in Canadians and invests in our future. The Conservatives are trying to tell you that cuts and austerity are the way to benefit the economy. They are wrong. We're, that is the choice Canadians are facing right now. Do we choose to continue to move forward, or do we go back to the Harper years? I'm noting that you did not specifically answer my question, so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. A Liberal government does not have a target date or, or goal in mind as to when it would balance a budget, if it ever wanted to. The Liberal government that we've uh, led over the past four years and the one that we are looking to continue makes the choice to invest in Canadians, but to do so in a responsible way. And the fiscal anchor we've chosen is to make sure that the size of our debt, as a proportion to the size of our economy, continues to decrease every single year. That is the responsible choice for Canadians because it has allowed us to invest in people, in their communities, and in your future, in students, in our seniors, in families because we know that is how we create more growth. Now, the Conservatives will tell you that balancing the books through cuts, through careful tax breaks to the wealthiest, is the best way to create growth. We disagree, and we have four years to d of, of proof points to demonstrate that this is how we grow the economy. And that is the choice facing Canadians right now. Do we continue to support families, to invest in the middle class, to invest in our communities? Or do we choose to double down on the conservative approach, which you know well in Ontario is cuts to education, cuts to services, cuts to families, cuts to health, as a way of trying to balance the books at all costs? We're making a different choice, and that is the choice that is at the heart of what Canadians are facing this election up till October 21st. Okay. Nous faisons un choix très différent des conservateurs qui vont continuer d'insister de créer que de créer l'équilibre budgétaire à tout prix en coupant dans les services, en coupant dans les investissements pour les familles, en coupant dans les investissements dans nos communautés, c'est la bonne façon d'avancer. Or on se souvient très bien de ce que dix ans des conservateurs sous Harper a fait pour notre économie, tout était plat. On n'a pas pu créer la croissance nécessaire. Or, dans quatre ans, avec notre approche qui investit dans les gens et dans leur communauté, on a vu la création d'emplois, d'un million d'emplois. On a vu, euh, la, la pouvoir, euh, on a sorti 900 000 personnes de la pauvreté. Et on a continué de démontrer qu'une société confiante dans son avenir investit dans cet avenir. Et c'est le contraste auquel les gens vont faire face. Est-ce qu'on on double, on double notre approche conservatrice ici en Ontario et ailleurs au pays 
en choisissant l'austérité et les coupures, ou est-ce qu'on choisit de continuer d'investir dans les familles, dans nos communautés? Moi, je choisis d'aller de l'avant. Moi, je choisis d'investir et j'encourage les Canadiens de faire le choix responsable également le 21 octobre. Monsieur Trudeau, à propos des nouveaux revenus, quand on regarde les nouveaux revenus, le 10 sur les bateaux de luxe, les avions de luxe, 3 sur les géants du web, 1,7 milliard sur les échappatoires fiscaux, le directeur parlementaire du budget dit que c'est très élevé l'incertitude que vous atteignez les chiffres qui sont dans votre document. Pourquoi y aller avec ces chiffres-là alors que l'incertitude est très élevée? Pourquoi y a pas avoir pris une mesure plus conservatrice ou même avoir descendu un peu vos chiffres justement en raison de l'incertitude? Parce qu'on a l'expérience de quatre ans. Euh, en 2015, on avait aussi euh, mis des, des investissements et des, et des, euh, des épargnes qu'on comptait pouvoir faire, des sources de revenus qu'on allait pouvoir faire, et on a largement dépassé nos, euh, nos, euh, nos cibles par rapport à ça en 2015, et on sait qu'on peut faire encore plus cette fois-ci. On a l'expérience de quatre ans en gouvernement qui nous euh, fait comprendre qu'effectivement, en allant euh, chercher plus d'argent chez les mieux nantis, en fermant des échappatoires fiscaux, on va pouvoir aller chercher des revenus significatifs. D'ailleurs, on a pu investir euh, énormément d'argent dans l'Agence canadienne du revenu au cours des quatre dernières années pour améliorer notre capacité d'aller euh, fermer ces échappatoires et on est très confiant dans notre capacité de continuer de le faire. Sur, euh, en 2015, en 2019, il y a beaucoup de choses qui ont changé. En 2015, vous disiez des petits déficits, il y a trois ans, on équilibre le budget en quatre ans. Là, on est dans des plus gros déficits, puis on n'a pas d'équilibre budgétaire à moyen terme. Vous disiez, on ne va pas taxer la TPS, la TVQ sur les géants du web comme Netflix, pas de taxe Netflix. Là, vous allez en mettre une. Qu'est-ce qui a changé chez vous, dans votre philosophie, pour que là, on arrive avec justement ces taxations sur les géants du web, notamment? Bien, on a pu démontrer d'abord, au cours des quatre dernières années, que ces investissements responsables dans nos communautés c'est ce qui a contribué euh, à la croissance économique, au bénéfice pour les individus et à une stabilité économique et, et sociale que d'autres pays, euh, pour lesquels d'autres pays nous envient. En même temps, on reconnaît la transformation euh, de l'économie mondiale avec l'arrivée de plus en plus euh, de géants euh, mondiaux, multinationales comme Disney et autres. Euh, qui vont commencer à faire du streaming au Canada. Et c'est important d'assurer de, que euh, des compagnies canadiennes euh, puissent, euh, puissent bénéficier des mêmes avantages euh, que les compagnies internationaux. Euh, et c'est pour ça qu'on travaille avec la communauté internationale pour arriver euh, à une approche qui est responsable. Theo Argetis, Bloomberg News. Uh, you mentioned many times that you retained your fiscal anchor declining debt-to-GDP ratio, uh, but just barely, right? Um, 2018, the debt-to-GDP ratio was 30.9%. In 2020, you see that 30.9%. In 2021, you see that 30.8%. It's very easy to imagine a scenario where that debt-to-GDP ratio increases, or just inches up anyways. What would you do in that situation? How wedded are you to your fiscal anchor? Well, I think as we are entirely wedded to the fiscal anchor, I think reducing the size of our debt as a proportion of our GDP every year is the responsible thing to do. Uh, but I will make a mention of that, that we took as our starting point for this fiscal frame the PBO's budgetary projections, because that's the responsible and prudent thing to do. Except from the time that the PBO's fiscal frame was put out in June, We've already seen multiple bank and private sector economists uh, say that those numbers were far too pessimistic. We're already on a much better track than we were before. So we have tremendous confidence in Canadians, in the Canadian economy, that as we continue to invest in people and create opportunities and contribute to a frame that is creating better competitiveness, better entrepreneurship, more jobs, Uh, we are going to continue to demonstrate the wisdom of investing in people as a way of growing the economy and the contrast with conservatives who just want to cut to balance the budget at all costs. I realize it's, I realize it's a hypothetical, but let's say the economy doesn't grow as quickly as you thought it would and that debt to GDP ratio starts to inch higher. Would you cut spending or not spend as much as you wanted to in order to meet your fiscal anchor? 
But as I just laid out, we've already seen the economy grow significantly better than even those pessimistic projections by uh, the uh, parliamentary budget officer. We are going to continue to invest in people because we know that that is what creates growth and opportunity for all Canadians and leads to a better economic outlook for us all. At a time of anxiety and uncertainty in the world, investing in Canadians is uh, the sure way to create greater opportunities. And again, this, and again, the contrast is crystal clear with Conservatives who are obsessed with cutting to balance the books at all costs, where we are focused on investing responsibly in you for our future. Abigail Beeman, Global News. There are at least three major promises in this platform that are not costed. No specifics on pharmacare, nothing on a low-cost national flood insurance plan, and nothing on a guaranteed income uh, for parents who don't qualify for EI. How can you commit to that lowering the debt-to-GDP ratio when there's some big promises that don't have price tags? Well, we recognize that on pharmacare, there's only so much the federal government can do on our own. Uh, we have moved forward in three big pieces of the expert panel report on how to bring in national pharmacare. That is uh, making sure we're moving forward on a Canada Drug Agency, making for sure we're moving forward on uh, high-cost drugs for rare diseases, uh, and uh, moving forward to lower the cost of medications through bulk purchasing power, which is actually uh, on track to saving Canadians $13 billion a year uh, over the next 10 years. But we also know that, yes, it is going to require partnership with the provinces. And we recognize uh, that Doug Ford and Jason Kenney and other provincial premiers uh, are not going to want to be investing in health care, investing in your services. So the question for Canadians becomes, who do you want sitting across the table to negotiate the future of our health care? Andrew Scheer, who supports Doug Ford and Jason Kenney and is supported by them, or a Liberal government that is going to continue to put your interests first? That is the choice facing Canadians. Not all of the promises uh, not all of the promises are dependent on the provinces, so I ask again, how can you commit to lowering debt to GDP ratio without price tags? We worked uh, with the parliamentary budget officer on cost costing uh, our platform. Uh, this is something that we put in place as a government. It was a commitment we made in 2015 to make sure that all political parties had access to the parliamentary budget officer to make sure that Canadians were properly informed about the strengths and weaknesses and the responsibilities and costings of the various platforms. We were proud to be able to make this available not just to parties but through the parties to Canadians so people can see what these investments are and how they're going to build a stronger future. We will, of course, uh, design these programs in a responsible way uh, once, once we uh, form government, if that's the choice Canadians make. Uh, but I can assure you, we will continue to stand by that fiscal anchor uh, that ensures that we're investing responsibly in your future through giving you the strength to succeed and your communities. Marika Walsh from the Globe and Mail. You're planning to spend $525 million in new money on the Learn to Camp program and $400 million in new money on tackling gun violence. Why are you spending more on Learning to Camp than on tackling gun violence? We recognize that there's always more to do, uh, and we will keep doing it. Uh, when it comes to gun control, Canadians have a very simple choice. Liberals want to strengthen gun control. Conservatives want to weaken gun control. We know that supporting our communities, supporting communities that want to restrict or ban handguns is something we need to do. Banning military-style assault weapons right across the country is something that Canadians have long asked for and something we will be delivering. Conservatives are going to weaken gun control, so we are pleased to be working and investing in communities on that. On the environment, we know that Canadians care deeply about how we are protecting nature and how we are raising future generations of Canadians who understand the opportunities and, and uh, the responsibility to be stewards of the environment. That's why we invested over the past four years more money in the Learn to Camp program, and we saw uh, the numbers go from 10,000 people a year through this Parks Canada program to 100,000 
people a year. And the interest in this program and the uh, opportunities given to Canadians from coast to coast to coast uh, has exploded, uh, and we are happy to be investing so even more people can discover the great outdoors. We are uh, making choices that both protect the environment and make our communities safer. And again, it's a direct contrast with conservatives who want to weaken gun control and will do nothing to protect our environment. Are your priorities, though, not out of step with Canadians? Do you think Canadians support spending more money on camping than on fighting gun violence? This election is about a choice, a choice uh, between Liberals who are going to be investing more in protecting the environment, investing more in stronger gun control, versus Conservatives who don't think protecting our environment or fighting climate change is a priority at all because they have no plan for that. They were hiding from the climate marches on Friday. Or investing uh, more uh, in, uh, in supporting our nature. These are the things that Canadians are going to make a choice about in the coming weeks. Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. Uh, you mentioned that under Doug Ford's cuts to education, about 10,000 teachers would lose their jobs. But according to Ontario's Financial Accountability Office, that reduction in teaching positions can be achieved without any layoffs at all. That can likely be achieved through attrition. Uh, Doug Ford isn't even on the ballot. Uh, are you trying to mislead Canadians by associating Shear with Ford? Mr. Scheer is the person who has associated himself with Doug Ford. Uh, and we have seen at which point uh, Conservatives campaign on saying they're for the people and then turn around and make real cuts uh, that affect people's lives. And that's exactly the frame uh, that Andrew Scheer and the Federal Conservatives are putting forward. You want a proof point of what Andrew Scheer has done, uh, would do? Look at what Doug Ford has done. That is what Canadians need to be aware of and responsible for. Andrew Scheer is asking Canadians to double down on the kind of conservative leadership that weakens gun control, that does nothing for our environment, and at the same time gives tax breaks to the wealthiest while cutting services for everyone else. I know Canadians are very aware of the choice that they're facing between our Liberal vision to continue moving forward with a Conservative approach that goes back through cuts and austerity. For a speech that's talking about your own plan, you've spent a lot of time talking about uh, Mr. Scheer as well as Doug Ford. Um, why? This election is about a choice. This election is about a choice of the kind of country we want to live in, the kind of future we want to build. And the choice couldn't be clearer two very different visions of how to move the country forward. The Conservatives think that balancing the budget at all costs through cuts and austerity and giving advantages and tax breaks to the wealthiest in the hopes that it'll trickle down to create growth for everyone else, well, that's their approach. I think it's the wrong approach. And in 2015, Canadians thought it was the wrong approach as well, because they chose a government that instead wanted to invest. Invest in the middle class, invest in their communities, invest in science, restoring the long-form census is one of the very first things uh, we did. We decided to invest in Canadians' future. And four years later, we have the numbers to show for it. 900,000 Canadians lifted out of poverty, including 300,000 kids. Over a million new jobs created, most of them full-time, and the lowest unemployment in 40 years. That's what the choice gave us in 2015. That's the choice facing Canadians right now. Do we go back to the failed Harper approach, which is exactly what Andrew Scheer is offering, or do we move, continue to move forward with a liberal plan that invests in Canadians? I'm for moving forward.
Kathleen Harris from CBC News. Um, without a dollar figure in the platform for PharmaCare, should Canadians assume that there will be no tangible progress other than discussions with the, pro the provinces in the next four years? We have already made tangible progress in PharmaCare. We have uh, set in place measures that will reduce the cost of prescription drugs by $13 billion for Canadians over the next 10 years. We have moved forward on, uh, on absorbing the cost of high-cost uh, medicines for rare diseases, which was a significant challenge for the provinces. <clears throat> and we're moving forward on the creation of a Canadian drug agency that will uh, create a national formulary. But yes, there is more investment and more work to do with the provinces. But I can tell you, we will not be sending a single penny to Doug Ford or Jason Kenney if they are not prepared to move forward in a real way on a national pharmacare plan. That is why we know there are negotiations to have. And the question for Canadians is, who do they want sitting across from Doug Ford negotiating the future of our health care system? Andrew Scheer or this Liberal government? talk about his life before entering politics and his credentials. Do you think he misled Canadians on his, his uh, credentials before I will politics? let Andrew Scheer answer those questions. Uh, our focus is on building a stronger future for all Canadians. Last question, Dalia Castillo. Mr. Trudeau, your India trip was great success, though it has some controversies too. We don't have very great relations with China, but at the same time, India, which is the largest democracy in the world, we are a democratic country too. That they are fastestly growing economy, but we don't see much progress in these relations. We can see lots of Indo-Canadian foreign students here in this hall. You have enough members in your caucus too, but we don't see that reflecting in the policies of India and, and Canada. And if you are re-elected again, any take on that? Uh, we have actually succeeded in increasing uh, commercial relationships uh, with India uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, we've seen increased investment, we've seen increased partnership, but absolutely, as you say, there's much more to do. India is a, a growing economy, taking more and more uh, opportunities up on the world stage. Uh, and in Canada's uh, strong relationship with India, both on the commercial level and in terms of people-to-people -people ties, uh, there is much more to do. And we are continuing to demonstrate that we understand that opening up relations around the world, standing strong for our values, and creating opportunities for Canadians is a real priority. We were able to demonstrate over the past four years that we understand that signing trade deals in a way that benefits Canadians, benefits workers, benefits small businesses, is at the heart of how we move forward in a globalized world. That's why we are now the only G7 country with a free trade deal with every other G7 country. And we are going to continue uh, to ensure that Canadian small businesses and workers uh, benefit from our participation in the global economy, and we'll be, of course, continuing to work on uh, closer commercial relations and people-to-people -people ties uh, with uh, all of our uh, friends around the world, including India. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you very much for the media questions. Now we get to the fun part. Uh, I'm going to start here, and we'll go right around the room, uh, and I'll start with you right there. Uh, my name is Carla Cisneros. I'm a PhD candidate at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs in Ottawa. Before I do my, well, I ask my question, I wanted to mention that I got inspired to start my PhD after I heard the speech from you and another speech from President Barack Obama. So I'd really like to shake your hand after this town hall, if you would allow me. Of course. <laughs> Great. Okay. So my question is, um, I'll tell you about one of my classmates at the PhD program. Um, her name is Jen Spencer. She's a bright young Canadian and a single mom as well. She dropped out of the program this past week. And the reason she did that is for two reasons. One, tuition is very expensive. And you addressed that today, so that's great. Um, but also childcare is very expensive. And after the OSAP cuts, which she was using to pay for three days of childcare per week, after those cuts happened, she had to drop out. She had no choice. 
So what would a re-elected liberal government do to ensure that Canadians don't have to make these choices and can choose to go to school and also can choose to have children? So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your questions, and I'm terribly sorry to hear uh, Jen's story, but unfortunately it's a story that we do hear an awful lot, and that's uh, why on both sides of the challenges Jen is facing, uh, we're making investments. We recognize uh, that even though delivering uh, social services is primarily a provincial responsibility, um, the federal government can and do more. That's why we are doubling our investments, uh, our federal investments in childcare towards the provinces, specifically on after school care, before and after school care. Uh, we know that uh, for a lot of parents uh, who have kids between five and 10, when the school day ends, um, they're still working uh, or still studying and therefore need uh, more after-school care spaces, which is why uh, we're investing in that because that's something we've heard from Canadians. On top of that, we will be increasing the Canada Child Benefit by 15% for kids under one because when you have a new baby, uh, that is one of the big challenges uh, at the, uh, with extra costs. Uh, we're also uh, going to be ensuring uh, that when you start a family uh, and when you have kids under five, uh, you don't have to worry about student loans. Uh, we've done uh, more about uh, encouraging and ensuring people with families can get to school, can uh, go back to work, and there's more to do. Specifically around student loans, uh, you don't have to pay back while, you're having, while you have young kids. Uh, we also are making sure you don't have to be worried about paying back your student loans until you're making at least $35,000 a year. These are all things that will help, but we also recognize that um, the provincial government has a role to play in that right now, uh, and that's why we feel that doubling down on the conservative approach, uh, which isn't taking care of families, uh, would be a terrible choice for Canadians. But please give your friend my best and tell her I'm sorry. Thank you. you in the back. Okay, I have a question. So, in the light of recent events that came to light when someone shared one of your old photographs with the media, let me say here first that I know you're not a racist, sir, I, and I think your apology was sincere from the heart. And I'd like to thank you for that. Back to my question, I don't mean to diminish the impact or what your recently released photo, photograph means, but is nothing compared to what my generation has willingly or unwillingly shared online. So is it time that Canada introduces a European style right to the forgotten legislation and other measures to protect Canadians' online privacy? We have clearly seen that left to the for-profit corporations, the issues will not go away. Google is the business of search. The billions they make every year mostly come from search. The more information they have, the more search results they can provide to people, making them more money. Uh, thank you, thank you for your words. And on, uh, on the blackface photos, uh, I uh, take responsibility for having hurt um, many people who face discrimination every single day in their daily lives, and uh, what I did was wrong. I should have known it then, I didn't, uh, but certainly I will continue to, uh, as I have in government, as I have as a politician, uh, fight against discrimination and intolerance every single day. Uh, and there's always more to do, and we will be doing more. Um, on the issue of, of uh, the internet giants, uh, we recognize that data and data privacy and data protection uh, is a huge area of responsibility that governments have been uh, slow to react to and adjust to. That's why, uh, with the help of the Honorable Navdeep Bains, we put forward a digital charter uh, in this country that includes uh, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right to know what your data, uh, what data people have on you, uh, and uh, have more, more control over what happens with that data. Uh, this is something that uh, is high time people have the same kind of rights in the digital sphere uh, that they have in real life as well. On top of that, we recognize uh, that the internet giants are making massive profits and using tax avoidance schemes around the world uh, to not pay their fair share of taxes. So we're going to ensure that revenue generated in Canada by those large corporations actually does uh, get taxed and benefit our society. So these are things we're moving forward concretely on. Thank you for your concerns. Uh, next question, you in the back row. Yep. Thanks. 
Um, my name is Joe from North Park Secondary School, and I have a question that if you are ever re-elected, um, do you have any plans on reforming the education system entirely within Ontario to make a more progressive and uh, more modern approach on education than the traditional form we have today, as we see countries as, as such as Sweden take a much more progressive and futuristic look on education than the old and outdated version we have today, because we see many students having problems with the way we are taught in our current uh, education system. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have sort of three different angles I take on this question. The first one uh, is, uh, as a former school teacher, uh, I spent uh, many years uh, teaching uh, middle school and high school primarily, uh, French and math mostly, uh, out west with a little time in, uh, in, uh, in Quebec as well. Uh, and I know how important it is that our education system uh, meets the needs of our students. And I recognize there is a lot of room for innovation, for transformation, for investments that are going to better prepare our students uh, to be succeeding in a world that is itself transforming. So that's sort of my first perspective on it. My second perspective is as a dad who has three kids in the Ontario public system right now uh, and is really worried about some of the cuts and the approaches that um, that, the, that the Conservative government is taking on this, and uh, I'm very much trying to ensure that my kids have the best possible education to prepare them for uh, the transformation and the future of our economy and the future opportunities they'll have to work and, and succeed. Uh, the third perspective is the one that limits my ability to do much in the first two, is that I'm a federal politician. Uh, and uh, I respect our Constitution that says that control over K-12 to education is a provincial responsibility. Uh, and all I can do as a former teacher and as a parent with kids in the system uh, is uh, talk about the kinds of changes we need to see, the kinds of transformation I hope to see for my kids uh, and for uh, kids across province and indeed the country to be ready to contribute and to succeed to the level that we're going to need kids to succeed to. Uh, and that's where I highlight that the choices people make in an election really, really matter. Uh, and the choice people made of picking a conservative government that said it was for the people here in Ontario and then delivers cuts to everyone else uh, should remind them that the choice facing Canadians right now of either picking uh, a liberal government that is going to continue to invest as we have uh, in helping our kids succeed, helping families succeed, helping our communities succeed, versus a conservative approach that continues to think cuts, austerity, and tax breaks to the wealthiest and the big polluters uh, is somehow the way to grow a better future for our kids. I know that choice is clear for Canadians, and I look forward to October 21st. Uh, next question. Yes, you in the glasses and the gray shirt. Yes. Hi, my name is Olivia LaHaye. I'm a recent graduate, actually, at UTM in the Masters of Sustainability Management program. So I I'm going to guess that you can know where my question's headed. Um, so recently you just talked to Greta Thunberg yesterday, and I was wondering, you know, it seems you're doing a great job in the natural, uh, natural climate solutions. I'd love to see that. However, a big part of her platform is part of funding natural solutions is reducing the subsidies for oil and gas. We have to start leaving the oil in the ground if we're going to address the climate problem that we have. So I'm wondering at what point the little party starts to actually say average is not good enough for us to say no carbon taxes for you because our oil and gas companies only have to perform a little bit better than average to basically not pay the carbon tax. So when are we going to start actually removing the subsidies from oil and gas companies? That is, that is a great question. Thank you for that. And it's something that I, I am extremely passionate about. Uh, I, I did uh, uh, master's level studies in environmental geography at McGill uh, and saw very clearly the challenge even 10, 12 years ago uh, that we were facing as a society and have been working very, very hard uh, as just a, a, a politician first and since as prime minister to move the dial forward on the most important issue of our time, how we are fighting climate change, how we are building a stronger environment. And there is no question that we absolutely support 
the internationally made commitment of phasing out all fossil fuel subsidies by 2025 uh, as part of what we're doing. We've also brought in a price on pollution that Conservatives are choosing to use your dollars to fight in court, um, and that price on pollution will increase in stringency every year up until 2022. Um, and then we will look at the situation and decide uh, what we need to do more and how we need to do more, and there'll be an election in 2023 that we get to fight exactly on that. But I really, really hope that by the time the next election comes around, it won't be as stark a choice between a conservative party that doesn't believe we need to act at all to fight climate change and protect our environment, and a liberal party that believes that we do. The more Canadians, and this is why I was so grateful uh, to Greta Thunberg and the, the you know, half a million Canadians I got to march with in my hometown in Montreal on Friday and others right across the country for highlighting that this is a real issue that we need to take clear action on and we need to do more. The challenge is in Canada that conservative premiers just got elected from the Rockies to the Bay of Fundy promising less action on fighting climate change, promising no action on fighting climate change. They simply don't get it, that you cannot build a stronger economy for the future if you are not at the same time protecting our environment. So yes, we've done a lot. There's an awful lot more to do. And some of the advantages we're giving to clean tech companies, we're cutting corporate taxes in half for businesses that are creating zero emission technologies. This is going to draw jobs in to Canada from around the world in a trillion dollar zero emission sector uh, that is the kind of thing we're going to invest in so that we can manage this transition uh, in a responsible way uh, that will get us to reaching our targets both in 2030 and net zero by 2050. Thank you for your work. Okay, next question. You with the blue t-shirt. Hi, my name is Sean and I'm from the Reading of Huron Bruce. One of the consequences of our amazing economic growth over the last four years is that in some parts of Canada, unemployment rates are so low that it's becoming hard to find employees, particularly in the agricultural industry. Um, how is it this platform going to ensure that young people in our rural communities will return and work in, our, uh, in their communities? Listen, thank you for that question. And it's something I've seen across rural Canada. Uh, challenges around uh, sh labor shortages, challenges around young people leaving their communities for education and not coming back because they don't have any jobs to come back to. That is something we absolutely need to turn around. And there's a lot of pieces of our liberal approach that goes directly to that. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the big barriers to success of small businesses and, uh, and families in rural or remote areas areas is access to reliable internet broadband. Uh, we know uh, that this is a massive challenge and that's why we're investing billions upon billions of dollars in delivering more reliable high-speed uh, broadband service uh, across the country with some very ambitious targets for 2025 and 2030, but the work is starting, has already started over the past couple of years and will accelerate in the coming years. Um, for uh, our agricultural producers, uh, we know uh, that access to greater markets around the world is a tremendous opportunity, but it also comes with certain challenges, which is why we are strengthening our risk management programs, our support for agricultural industries, because we know uh, that Canadians need to continue to be competitive on the world stage and need to be able to continue uh, to provide the high quality products that we need here at home. And further, uh, we know uh, that investing in drawing in people from around the world, the best and the brightest, to come to Canada to contribute uh, to growing the economy, not just in our big cities, uh, but in communities right across the country where the opportunity uh, to give a great life to yourself and your kids uh, is there, uh, is something that we're going to continue to invest in, in strengthening Canada's immigration system and making sure that people can continue to come here from all around the world in the right way, uh, in ways that are beneficial for all of us. So thank you for your question. Uh, we're going to accelerate as we come around here. You in the white shirt. Uh, good afternoon. 
Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, I'm just pulling up my question. So if elected to a second term, would we be seeing any changes to our electoral system towards the inclusion of a proportional representation um, and a gradual segue away, away from the current first-past-the-post system? Um, it was a, a commitment I made uh, a number of years ago we sp in the 2015 election. Uh, we spent a year uh, in town halls, uh, engaged committees uh, across the country, uh, and it was very clear that there was no consensus. Uh, the uh, NDP wanted proportional representation. The Conservatives wanted a referendum to keep the status quo, uh, and we were looking at a preferential ballot. Uh, the reality is you can't make an irreversible change to our electoral system if there is no consensus, and the lack of consensus meant uh, instead of pushing forward on something that had the potential of dividing, of hurting Canadians, uh, we would put it aside. And that's the decision that we took. Thank you for your question. Um, you. Yes. Hi, I'm Shaza. I'm here indep independently. And my question is, I guess it falls under the umbrella of discrimination. I want to know whether there are any initiatives on the agenda to nationalize diversity and sort of limit ignorance, such as um, government encouraged TV programs along the lines of Little Mosque on the Prairie or Kim's Convenience, or even subsidizing travel within Canada for youth to increase their exposure? Uh, yes, there are. We have put in place Canada's first anti-racism strategy uh, with about $45 million uh, over the last year uh, to move forward uh, in funding initiatives across the country that would be brought forward uh, to fight unconscious bias and systemic discrimination and anti-black racism and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and the range of challenges. Uh, and in this platform, we're committing to actually doubling that funding so that uh, ideas like yours and more ideas brought up by communities across the country uh, for moving forward, including on things like uh, training sessions for, uh, for governments, for civil servants, for organizations on better understanding uh, systemic bias, uh, unconscious bias and systemic discriminations that so many of us simply do not see. Uh, there is a lot of work still to do, but Canada needs to move beyond tolerance. Right? Tolerance is putting up with someone's right to exist as long as they don't get too much in your face. I tolerate you is not something you actually want to hear someone say to you. We need to move beyond tolerance to acceptance, friendship, love. I mean, there isn't a religion in the world that says, tolerate thy neighbor. It's love your neighbor, right? So that approach and creating programs and, and investments to the amazing organizations across the country that are already working very hard on this is uh, a continued priority for us. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, question from back here. Yes. Good evening, my name is Kanisha Aurora and I'm actually the student trustee for the Peel District School Board. Um, I'm also a member of Minister Navdeep Baines' Youth Council and I'm very passionate about science, technology, engineering and mathematics. I was actually at a first robotics hour of code event where Minister Navdeep Baines announced that um, the, the, fe the federal government will be teaching two million students how to code and as a student who's going to be progressing to the 21st century I think that's absolutely amazing but my question to you is how can we move further than that how can we create the next innovators of tomorrow by incorporating AI technology virtual reality and other exponential technologies within our education systems I think that's a uh, that's a great a great question and thank you for your your work uh, Navdeep needs all the help he can get from brilliant young people so uh, he's uh, it's great that he's getting it um, I mean, we know that our workplaces of the future are going to be transformed and that is a source of anxiety for an awful lot of people who wonder what's going to happen to their jobs what's going to happen uh, for their kids' jobs as AI takes more space as science as research as uh, STEM uh, areas develop, there is a certain anxiety about the future that's happening. And societies face a bit of a choice, and politicians face a bit of a choice. Do we sort of say, oh no, we're going to keep things the way they are, or even go backwards and make things great again? Uh, or uh, do we choose to move forward? Do we choose to say, you know what, we can equip ourselves with the tools and the ability to create this future and to lead into that future. And that's exactly what our government has chosen to do. 
We are investing in AI. We are investing in science and research, including pure science, not just commercial science, uh, to record degrees at the same time as we are investing in young scientists, as we are investing uh, in uh, workers who realize that they need to go back to school to get new skills so that they can uh, be solid until and beyond retirement. We know that we're in a transformative time in our economy, and the choice of sort of hiding from it and trying to protect citizens from the changes that are coming is not the one we're taking because we choose to equip young people and people in their careers with the skills that they're going to need to be successful in those worlds. Canada is going to be able to shape the future with our contributions to science, to innovation, and make sure that our values of openness, of respect, of diversity, of hard work and ambition are the kinds of things that animate the direction, not just Canada, but the whole world is going in. And investing in greater opportunities in STEM and research is a really big part of that. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. Next question. Yes. All right, so I'm a grade nine student and I was wondering like, you know right side to the satellite? over mm -hmm. the Arctic, that was revolutionary for Canada and it showed the world that like, hey, we're here and we can do, and we're good at it, right? So um, I was just wondering what else can we do in that area? Uh, you're absolutely right. RadarSat was uh, something that Canada uh, had significant leadership on and we, we have, you know, when we, uh, when the U.S. Uh, landed people on the moon, uh, part of it was thanks to uh, an incredible number of Canadian scientists who were part of that NASA project. Canada has always led the way on uh, innovations in science, in exploring new frontiers, and in space programs. Uh, that's why uh, l earlier this year, uh, I was so pleased to announce uh, that Canada is going to be part of an international project to go to the moon. Uh, the Lunar Gateway is the successor to the International Space Station. Uh, it is a project that is going to require significant amounts of AI and robotics, areas in which Canada is already specialized. Because if you imagine the lag time in communications between uh, an Earth-based uh, control system and uh, a station in orbit around the moon, you realize that the need for automation and uh, robotization is going to be significant uh, with the distances involved, which is why Canada is a very important participant in uh, the Lunar Gateway program that has been announced, and we're going to continue uh, to uh, break down new frontiers as we advance as a country that is deeply committed uh, to science that, yes, explores the universe, but also make sure Canadians get the benefits here at home from the tremendous innovations that will come with it. Thank you for your question and your passion. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a student here uh, at, U at U of T, focusing on defense and foreign affairs. Uh, first, I'd like to compliment you quickly, your government, on choosing the Type 26 to replace the Halifax frigates over the next few years. Uh, I think it's experimental, but I think it's the right choice, personally. Um, my question for you is, what, in, a, in our world where China is rising as a uh, global power, what are Canada's um, defense and or diplomatic priorities over the next five to ten years? Well, I think not just China, but we see a realignment and uh, repositioning in the global global order and the global framework that we've set for so many years, or we've seen set. I mean, over the, over the 70 years since the end of the Second World War, um, there was a particular frame that was doing very well based on a rules-based order, international law, uh, and a framework that allowed for uh, tremendous stability, uh, economic growth, and prosperity around uh, a sort of Western approach uh, that um, that was underpinned by uh, the Pax Americana, the Americans uh, you know, being uh, the only remaining superpower, uh, encouraged and enshrined a perspective 
uh, that benefited Canada significantly. Over the past few years, we've seen uh, the Americans withdraw a little bit from that uh, engagement on the world stage and that uh, assuring of the global order, and therefore we've seen uh, rising influences and powers from places like China, uh, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, others uh, that are taking more space and perhaps questioning the framework that has served us very, very well as a world. Now, the only constant is change, so uh, the question becomes, how do we as a country continue to stand for our values, our principles, and what has always benefited both Canadians and people around the world at a time where there's a lot more questioning of it? And the way we do that is, first of all, by demonstrating what works so well at home. That diversity, openness, respect, respect for human rights and the rule of law actually leads to more prosperous and more stable societies than the alternatives. But then we also have to make sure that we are working with like-minded nations to present a united front and a cogent argument about how this is the path that developing countries could be taking. As we look at countries that are you know, on the edge of developing uh, real prosperity, real opportunities for their citizens, they are going to be presented with different models and different approaches uh, to how to create and assure stability and prosperity for their students. And we need to make sure that what has worked so well for Canada and worked so well for so many countries around the world continues to be a compelling option that they are supported in their choices of. So yes, China is taking up more space on the world stage and they have a framework that is not uh, exactly aligned with our framework around rights and values. And we have to make sure that we are demonstrating both our deep conviction and our firmness around our approach, but doing it in a way that allows others to see our approach as accessible and even an opportunity for them. That is how Canada engages on the world stage. We don't impose our solutions on everyone, but we do do a little bit and we need to do more, pointing out, you know, well, look what we're doing and it's working pretty well. Maybe there's a version that we can help you with that would work for you. That kind of approach of how we can best help in the world has animated Canada's foreign policy over the past few years, whether it's UN peacekeeping or uh, you know, fighting uh, for uh, more opportunities for women in developing countries, uh, or whether it's uh, part of uh, international accords like those to fight climate change. Canada is playing a strong, positive role, and we will need to continue to do so. Thank you for your question. I think we have time for two last questions. So you in the great, great jacket there. Thanks. Uh, my name is Matt McMahon. I'm from uh, Windsor. I uh, lived in Toronto the last five years. Uh, you mentioned climate change is one of the key things of, uh, of your platform. Um, and you also mentioned that you have the interests of all Canadians in mind, yet uh, the pipeline goes directly against the climate change platform as well as the interests of the indigenous groups that occupy that area which is kind of going exactly against what you're saying. So what's your response to that? Um, first of all, it, it, as you know, um, it wasn't an easy decision, but I believe it was the right decision in the national interest to move forward with the TMX expansion uh, in two ways and for two reasons. First of all, right now, 99% of our oil resources get exported to the United States. And over the past years, the U.S. has gone from a net importer of energy to a net exporter of energy. So they've gone from our biggest customer to one of our biggest competitors. Uh, continuing to sell our oil only to the United States doesn't make economic sense anymore because they give us a massive discount for our oil. And yes, we need to get to net zero by 2050. There's a transition we're part of, but right now and tomorrow and the day after, we're going to continue to need fossil fuels. Yes, we have to get off of them as quickly as possible uh, or reduce our dependence on them, but the way we're going to do that is by having the money necessary to invest in those solutions, to develop those technologies. That's why every dollar of profit from that Trans Mountain expansion is going to be put into uh, fighting climate change and clean energy transition. 
The other piece of it is that pipeline is going to actually replace oil that is currently being transported by rail. The pipeline, we are seeing more and more oil transported by rail over these past years, and doubling the capacity of the Trans Mountain Pipeline will actually remove some of those rail cars, will remove the stress of transporting that oil while we need it to new markets, but to do it in a cleaner and safer way than oil by rail. So those are sort of the two pieces around that, that we recognize that we are able to move forward on that Trans Mountain expansion because Alberta made a commitment to cap in absolute terms its emissions, the oil sands emissions. Therefore, that pipeline fits entirely within the uh, climate change plan that we put in place over the past few years. And again, the, the, there are indigenous communities who are opposed to it, but there are indigenous communities who are not only supportive of it, but want to become purchasers of that pipeline project. So there are a range of voices, and our challenge, and what we've done, contrary to the conservative governments, uh, is work with indigenous communities, even those who disagree with moving forward on the pipeline, to figure out what their specific concerns are and can we allay them, allay those concerns and compensate for those concerns in a way that doesn't make them suddenly in favor of the project, but at least makes them less worried about the consequences of the project and participants in the benefits and the opportunities that are going to come from it. Government is always about making choices and putting the national interest and the long-term benefits of Canadians of both protecting the environment at the same time as we ensure a growing economy in sustainable ways is what we've always been focused on and what we always will. And I will end uh, with the very first question that was asked, but I started the other side of the aisle, so yes to you. Um, my name is Jillian, I'm a grade 12 student. My, I just want to start off by saying thank you for everything that you've done. And my question for you is, how do you plan on repairing relationship with China without alienating the United States? And on that note, in view of current leadership within the U.S., will Canada be looking at certain arrangements that we have, such as like extradition treaties and um, changing some of these agreements? Because clearly they seem to have jeopardized some relationships. Thank you. That's a, a, a great question, Jillian, and a, and a difficult question for the last question. So you're really getting your money's worth here today. Um, I think, first of all, we recognize that the current leadership of the United States is not necessarily aligned with the worldview that either I or many Canadians have. But Canadians didn't elect me prime minister to pick fights with our closest ally. They elected me prime minister to figure out how to work the relationship in ways that means jobs, stability, opportunity for Canadians, while at the same time we get to continue to stand up clearly and strongly for our values, for our interests, and for Canada's positioning. And I think those two things, of standing up for Canadian values and protecting Canadians' interests, have uh, driven our perspective on the relationship with the United States throughout. Now, you will remember that when the current president came into office, he came in on a promise to rip up NAFTA. Now, $2 billion worth of goods and services pass the border every single day between Canada and the United States. A ripped up NAFTA would be an absolute disaster for Canada and for the United States because there are millions upon millions of jobs in the U.S. as well that rely on trade and export to Canada. So, as President Trump got elected, we got to work. Working with governors, members of Congress, uh, business organizations, companies in the United States that understood how important the relationship with Canada was. And we were able to renegotiate a positive NAFTA deal with one of the most unpredictable and protectionistic American administrations uh, in recent history. 
And we did so because all Canadians stepped up together. When you had former conservative leaders saying the same kinds of things but from a different perspective to their counterparts in the United States, um, it showed a united perspective that went beyond politics, beyond ide ideology here in Canada and demonstrated that we could and would get a good deal for Canada. And we got that cultural exemption we needed. We kept Chapter 19 dispute resolution. We kept the things that mattered for Canadians and secured our access to the most important market for uh, our economy. And then when they turned around and put pressure on us by bringing in punitive steel and aluminum tariffs uh, that were hurting our workers, we brought in countervailing duties that actually pushed back and to the point that they actually ended up just unilaterally removing them. And I said we were united across the country, whether it was uh, you know, premiers, conservative premiers, uh, like former Premier Brad Wall, or former prime ministers like Brian Mulroney, uh, or uh, former conservative cabinet ministers who were part of our, our, uh, our NAFTA panel. There was a respect and an understanding that we all needed to work together on this issue. Most of us. Of course, there's always going to be exceptions. And Andrew Scheer and Stephen Harper thought we should just capitulate. Doug Ford said to me, well, we should just give up on our countervailing duties, and maybe that would make them nice enough to lift the steel tariffs. It was some of the worst advice I'd ever got in terms of negotiation. And fortunately, we didn't listen to those conservative politicians for whom capitulation was a negotiating strategy. We stayed firm, we stayed strong, we stayed polite and respectful, but we did it in a very Canadian way that involved standing up for Canadians and highlighting that the partnership and the friendship between Canadians and Americans goes far beyond just who happened to be the leaders in place, that the connections between our countries run so deep that we will always be able to figure things out as long as we're standing up for ourselves. And that's exactly what we did. And yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier in an earlier answer, there are challenges around China right now. There are challenges around the global community right now. But we will continue to hold by our values and principles of standing up for what's right, standing up for Canadian interests, including those two Canadians who continue to be detained in China arbitrarily, while we look for creating opportunity that can be beneficial not just to Canadians, but to other people around the world. That is the role that Canada has in the world. That is a role we have played a positive, uh, positive uh, structure on over the past years, including when we first got in office and went to Paris to renegotiate and to ensure that countries signed on to the Paris Accord where Canada played a not insignificant role. We are going to continue to be strong, to be firm, and to be positive in our engagement with the world, standing up for Canadians and standing up for the benefit of everyone. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you, Mississauga. What a pleasure to be here today.